Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen W. Long. Uh, this is The Writing Life. And, uh, you know, this is a, sort of a, a special interview time. We have two folks with us. We normally just have one. Uh, and I think that this is going to be a lot of fun to explore some uh, uh, writing topics. And so uh, Marjorie Sandor and Tracy Doherty. And uh, you, this is not accidental that you're together. <laughs> no, not at all. All right. <laughs> uh, we, uh, you know each other. We have been colleagues, and we are now partners, married partners. <laughs> OK. Um, and uh, well, congratulations. <laughs> um, I heard about you folks. In fact, I saw you at uh, the Terroir Creative Writing Festival. And Tracy, you gave, I think, a keynote? Yes. And right. Marjorie, you did a, a workshop. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, have you, you have, you're both teachers, or at least right. they have been teachers. Yeah. So this is really not kind of a new experience for you. I came to Oregon State uh, in Corvallis in 1986, and at that time there wasn't a, a graduate creative writing program, and so I kind of began working immediately in trying to trying to create a program for okay. graduate students to come. Margie came in 1994, 94, and okay. uh, together over many many years we worked to try to create this community of writers in Corvallis. So we have been at this a long, a long time. time. Yeah. Yeah. Has it, <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm trying to think even how to frame this. I suspect that you see, at times, some startling talent. Is that Absolutely fair? Absolutely true. Yeah. Absolutely true. And we also see something else that I think is more important than talent. Sometimes we see extraordinarily disciplined young people who, okay. work, who want this very badly okay. and work really hard. And <clears throat> over the years, we've discovered that it's not necessarily the sort of firecracker kids, the ones that are you know, spectacularly talented, who eventually make a life in writing. It's the ones who keep their noses to the grindstone. And, what great advice. And grow and grow and grow. And it's really, it's, I mean, we've seen it firsthand. It's, it's a fact. And the, the thing that I tell the, the students also is it's not just about their own individual careers. Whatever future literature has in this country mm -hmm. is going to be these people who come together in small communities like, like writing programs sure. in universities around the country. When they leave the university, the, our hope is they will stay in touch with each other. They right. become the next yeah. connection. They right. become the next generation. Right. And so they will be helping each other and creating new things with each other down the road. It, it really needs to be a community. Yeah. The or other thing I was going to say is that the, uh, the other thing that happens in, in, t in a life of teaching, writing, is that you're teaching reader, reading. And, Right. turning people into into readers um, and there's a whole uh, there's a huge benefit to that even if not every single student becomes a writer which of course you know doesn't happen mm -hmm. but they're lifelong readers of great literature mm -hmm. um, after that and they go on sometimes to teach so there are other kinds of legacies that okay. get built. Yeah. Speaking of marriage we're, we're, we're grandparents many times over yeah. I think because we've introduced <laughs> students to each other who've gotten married. And really? They've had yeah. children of their own now yeah. so we feel Holy like cow. grandma and grandpa <laughs> now. <laughs> oh well, great. So that's another side. Yeah. Thing. yeah. I, uh, I, before we started I talked a little bit about Elizabeth George. She was my primary writing teacher and uh, she called it bum glue <laughs> and, uh, the, and, and in other words you have to do the work. Yeah. You can't just be sharp. You have to sit in the chair and you have to produce. And I think that that's something. Uh, I had another teacher who said, everybody wants to have written. Not so many people want to write. <laughs> and so you have to sit down and do that work. I had a teacher once who, who said to me when I was a student that no one can teach you how to write and no one can teach you to have an imagination, but what can be taught is editing. Oh. And you can become a better reader of your own work and of other people's work, and you can learn to tighten your sentences and your paragraphs. And I, I really think that's true, and that's kind of the model I followed as a teacher. Is sure. I don't try to tell people what to write or, or how to go about living their lives, but you can teach line editing, and that's, that's what they can Tracy, go on. that is super interesting. I'd never heard that, and, and what, what good advice. Yeah. I can tell you my senior project in college was uh, original work. And it was spectacularly awful. And uh, so from graduation until, gosh, I think I was 41 or something, I just thought I wasn't blessed with this talent. And, and too bad because I really liked it. But I went on and did something else. And then at some point came back and, and thought, 
gee, if you can learn to sing or you can learn to dance, maybe you can learn to write. Yeah. And so yeah. that was my first yeah. exposure yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think that's, that's absolutely, absolutely true. true. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. great. Um, a couple of things. We're, we've got so much to cover, but there are some awards I want to talk about. So you're about, and can we do that? Can sure. we talk about the award that you're, you're going to present? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And tell, tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Well, I'm th trying to think when this got, when did this happen? Was it two, 2011? Yeah, I think that sounds right. In 2011, um, a, a Portland businessman named Pat Stone um, uh, uh, wanted to do something for the liberal arts at Oregon State University because um, he had had a, a great experience coming back from, from war. Um, from having been at, I think he was in Vietnam. Vietnam. Okay. He came back from Vietnam and he <clears throat> did an art history degree at Oregon State and he said it changed his life. Oh so boy. he wanted to do something for the arts and his eye somehow fell on our program, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. wonderful. I think our dean may have pointed him in the right direction. Okay. Um, and so he gave this, he gave this amount of money that allows us to give a, a literary achievement award to an okay. American writer every two years. It's oh, one okay. of the biggest literary prizes in the country, really? monetarily. Yeah. Um, and so our first winner was Joyce Carol Oates. Ah. And, uh, and we were talking about this earlier. One of the important things about this award, it's not just the lifetime of writing uh, great work, but also uh, a reputation as a great mentor and teacher, because that's what Tracy and I really valued in the program mm -hmm. from the beginning that was important to us that we have a creative writing program that that really um, featured uh, strong mentorship you know there are creative writing masters programs all over the country and sometimes the teachers aren't really present they're busy pursuing their own careers oh, okay and it's really important to us that our teachers are not divas but they are um, they're producing their own work, but they're also paying really close attention. I would love to see you be a diva. Thanks. <laughs> what would that look like? I don't even know. So anyway, that so this award really okay. features both <clears throat> both of those things. Um, and this coming year, um, our winner is Colson Whitehead, who wrote the Underground Railroad. Yeah. Uh, and we're really excited about uh, uh, bringing him to Corvallis. We're also going to have him. We're we're going to be the premier sponsor at the nation's largest literary conference, the which is? Association of Writers and Writing Programs, AWP, oh, which will be in Portland okay. in late March, or late March. So Colson Whitehead is going to be the keynote speaker. Sure. We're the premier sponsor. Um, about 12,000 writers come to town. Uh, 12,000? 12 to 14,000. Oh, there's a book yeah. fair. Descending a, upon Portland. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's yeah. terrifying. And um, uh, there's, a, yeah. there's usually a good dance somewhere yeah. along the line. Um, so, and then we'll bring him down to Corvallis and he'll, he'll do an evening reading and we've had audiences for these Stone Award readings of about seven, eight hundred people. Sure. Um, and then he'll meet with the undergraduates for an hour and the grad students for an hour. And it's wonderful to watch these. And the kids will be reading him, kids. Yeah, the students, I know. It's be, all relative, they'll isn't be it? Reading, <laughs> it is. they'll, they'll, they'll be reading him all fall and winter. But it is in the tradition of this community building because it's yeah. it's a sense of tying tying the kids, the students, to, yeah. to an older generation of writers mm -hmm. um, and saying, you're a part of this. You're a part of something that's been going on for a long time and yeah. you're yeah. carrying it on and you're, you're connected. Right. Yeah. But you might, you know, it might be of interest to... Um, to uh, readers and writers locally here that that reading in Corvallis is free and open to the public. Well, I was really going to ask, how open is this? Very open. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other th the other pieces of it are not so open, right? Okay. I mean, the conference is something people register for, right? which they certainly can do. And and just to pursue that, how would somebody follow up and, and uh, find out about it and, and go to it? The, to the conference, yeah. the AWP conference? Yeah the big one in Portland, yeah. they would go to the AWP <coughs> website, which I believe is awpwriter.org. <laughs> okay. Uh, and there should be a, a thing that says conference there. And the Corvallis event would be in the, the uh, College of Liberal Arts website. Right. And that's terrific, State. too. Yeah. 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 Boy, yeah. Oh boy. And that one is absolutely free and open to the public, and it'll, it'll be, a, I think, a, there'll be a time for Q&A as well. J as and, and that's just to show up? That's and, just and, to show up, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, and I'm embarrassed to say this because I know I'm missing something. Colson Whitehead, I know that that's a, a famous name. Help me out. Why, why would I know that? 
His novel, The Underground Railroad, was published, I think, two, about two years ago mm -hmm. to huge, huge acclaim. Um, and it's, a, it's a, an imaginative recreation of the old notion of during, during the, the time of slavery, sure. the Underground Railroad being, uh, you know, this, this uh, apparatus and setup where, where slaves were so uh, is the, this smuggled is in or out, allowed to be freed. Novel, well, or? not really, because he, what he does is he takes the notion the Underground Railroad was not a literal railroad. It was right. pe people right. protecting slaves <clears throat> and, and getting them out of the country and other places to where they could be free. But he imagines it as a literal Underground Railroad. Oh, so for he heaven's takes, sakes. He okay. takes the idea and makes it literal and, and it's very fanciful, very imaginative, but it's very much a serious novel concerned with the issues of slavery and how slavery is in the DNA of this country and, and what, what does that mean really? historically, what does it mean for us now. Yeah. So it's, it's an amazing novel um, and, and that, is, that is his best known book, but he's written the, many, many stories. Did he win the National Book Award? Or? Yeah, and he certainly was a finalist for the for Pulitzer. Pulitzer. You may have won it. I, I'm, we'd have to yeah. well, do I'm research trying to, on his to, to th uh, yeah. The his name career. is so familiar mm -hmm. and I keep trying to link it uh, in a political way, but I, I think it sounds like I'm just wrong. No, I th he's been very, uh, he's, a, he's a young African-American writer, so I, he, he certainly has, has, I think, been called upon to, you know, okay. address social issues. Sure. Uh, so, so you're probably not wrong in that he's been in political context okay. as well, but his, his work is an imaginative approach to it, not, not so directly political. Right. Boy. So that's, that's one. Now there's another award. The one that we received? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so we, uh, we this, just this past spring, we received um, together as a couple, which was really sweet, this um, Literary Legacy Award. Um, it's called, it's called the Stuart Holbrook Award. He was a wonderful writer in the 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. cartoonist also, I believe, mm -hmm. um, sort of a muckraker, mm, uh, written okay. The New Yorker, uh, was an Oregonian, uh, and uh, so this award is to honor um, a long stretch of sort of community literary service. I think really that's what it's for. Okay. So uh, we, th we think, <laughs> we don't really know of course, um, but we, we think that we, we were given this award because of the community building that we've done down in Corvallis, not only with the MFA program, but also we, we created an, an event called the Magic Barrel Mm. which is a reading to fight hunger, and that takes place every, uh, every fall. It's October 19th this year, and it's uh, eight or nine writers and one fabulous MC from somewhere mm -hmm. in the Willamette Valley, and there's music and food, and there's a, it's at the historic Whiteside Theater downtown, and we raise about $10,000 for the really? local food share. Yeah. And it's a wonderful evening. So I think there's been some, we've had some fun doing some community work around literature, like sort of how, how could literature sure. yeah, really that's... directly, cha you know, sort of affect people's lives. Okay. Um, so. You get a legacy award when you have a certain amount of gray in your hair. I yeah. Think yeah. <laughs> you speak for well, yourself. I was going to say, you both look so young. But now you... Uh, uh, We're not. For, for, first, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you... Um, uh, would it be unusual for two people to get this it award? I, I guess, and that's yeah. so you, you kind of teamed up on while, this. Yeah. Every once in a while, yeah. I think it's been given to two people, but it's pretty unusual. Yeah, yeah we, we felt very honored. It yeah. was very special. Yeah. And I was interpreting a little bit here, but did you start the MFA program? Yes. And, it, and again, is this OSU? Yes. This is OSU. Yes. I, um, I, I can't take all of the credit. A lot of people were involved, but I yeah. was the first one to push for it, and I spent uh, about 14 years writing and rewriting proposals for it. Really? Meeting with state educators all, all over the state. a lot uh, of obstacles. But a lot of people at, at OSU were involved, uh, deans and chairs, and so uh, uh -huh. you know, it wasn't a, a one-person operation, but, right. but I was the one who got the ball rolling and, yeah. and stuck with it, and then Margie came up. Marjorie, I'm sorry. Yeah, come <laughs> Marjorie, Marjorie came along Impossible later, yeah. and and many other colleagues. So yeah, I like to think of Tracy as the person who kept trying to work on the jar lid, you know, okay, the person sure. who like works on the jar lid and mm -hmm. then doesn't, act, and then then later somebody <laughs> goes, oh, yes, right, yeah, <laughs> that was good, that, that, that hard. That wasn't so but bad. But he was, was working on the jar lid for I think 20 years, really. Yeah. Oh boy, through thick and thin. So yeah. it really is amazing. Well, that's that's really uh, quite Take an accomplishment. Credit. So. Good for you. Um, there's so much to, to go over. 
We had a book up here. Then we found another one. Oh, it's, uh, still, it's still here. <laughs> well, but no, I thought That's this the one you had up, right? One? Yeah, so yeah. this is the one that yeah. you want to... The, 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 you edited this one. I edited this yeah. one, yeah. And this one is actually a... Where are we at here? A, Talk a little bit about this right. thing. This began as a novel about three generations of a Jewish-American family uh -huh. um, going from the Midwest to the, um, to the coast, to California coast in, a, in the post-war years. Um, and uh, I couldn't quite make it work as a novel. I kept yeah. like not being able to find the narrative arc. So yeah. with, actually it was Tracy, I think, who, who said, uh, I think he put a contest deadline up on the fridge mm -hmm. and said, do it uh, as stories. Mm -hmm. So I broke it down into stories. So they're linked stories about this, about three generations of women in a family. Um, and, uh, and it came together f fairly quickly mm -hmm. once I gave Found the structure. Fa well, or gave up on worrying about structure and okay. just decided to write each chapter as if it were its own piece of okay, you know, never, whole. Okay, nevertheless, whole if you start it as a novel, this sounds like a collection of short stories. Yep. So then, are they fiction? Yep, they okay, are, okay. but they are. But based on? They are, they are, I, I took little bits and pieces of family history and um, distorted them to the point that uh, of distressing everyone in the family, not because they were true, but because they were so distorted. Sure. So my mother was a wonderful storyteller, okay. and uh, she regretted that all her life <laughs> because <laughs> I was regretted a, being, being a, a good storyteller. You know. Because yeah, because I she knew I was always listening. You know, sure. And and that I would warp the thing. Um, yeah. So whenever I would give readings from this, when she was she just passed away a couple of years ago, but when when I would give readings from this, I was I had to announce. Uh, that she never posed nude in wartime and that these are stories. As a mom, it says stories, and she goes, my friends don't care. Yeah. Like, What's from stories or essays, you know? Yeah. So um, I'm, really, uh, I'm really glad that it, it finally emerged in some form or another, and it was very... Oh, sure. It was, uh, and, and I had a wonderful editor at Sarah Band Books who, um, who helped me sort of shake up the order of the stories, so it, they're not the, there's a story that really chronologically belongs in the middle, and she said, let's pull it out and really? hold it and put it last. And it just was a trip to see what that did to the shape of the book. So it belonged in the middle chronologically? Chronologically. Okay. It's, a, it's a war story. It's okay. A, it's okay. a World War II story. Okay. And, uh, and sh and, but it contains a father's secret. Uh, so the secret sort of looms over the book. And isn't it's a hole, right? And that that is sort of filled in. So this resolves at it at the end. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. So it was it was a really brilliant suggestion on her part. Yeah. And, uh, that's really fun to work with editors who can s sort of see whole structures. Yeah. That way. Uh, do you? T uh, well, obviously you do. Take. Suge I was going to say criticism, and that's really the wrong word. But suggestions. So. Oh yeah. 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 This is my editor. <laughs> well, I was going to get there, but <laughs> yes. uh, I can imagine, uh, uh, I'm making this up, you're at home and you're, and you're writing away and you come home from, from school and uh, you want to get writing. Is there a uh, collaboration? Is there a competition? Is there... Well, Margie likes to joke that I, I type so loudly that she can't concentrate in the, in the study <laughs> next to mine. So, uh -huh. uh, but, uh, He's a we, drummer. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I, I, I type like a drummer, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we've never directly collaborated on a particular project. I but, but we are each other's first readers. We, you are, okay. We edit each other's work uh, and well, listen to each a, other, and, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful yeah, it is. thing. Yeah, it's really and to, to, to be living with someone who knows what you go through and, and to understand what she's going through, right. and it's a wonderful yeah. collaboration in that sense. So. Yeah. But we have our studies next door to each other upstairs in our house. and. The cats tend to leave us alone when we work, so it's the okay. The cats do not. The cats <laughs> sit at the door and weep. So, uh, right? So Aren't they always sitting at the door crying? But when, uh, <laughs> when, when Marjorie's daughter Hannah, who's now grown and uh, employed in Portland, she was a, a, a young child, and um, she would sleep in a little bit, and we would get up very early and tend to work early in the morning. And then when Hannah got up for breakfast, the writing would be over for the day, and we'd go to teach our classes. Oh, okay. That's kind of the okay. way it worked. So seriously, you, well, with me, um, I try to do mental things in the morning and physical things in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Is that kind mm -hmm. of, so you said you write in the morning. Yeah, right. When, yeah, we, we definitely, mm -hmm. things go best when we write 
really even before eating, mm -hmm. like okay. a little cup of coffee okay. and with a lot of milk in it or yeah. a little bit of toast and okay. straight up, that's when it goes well. I think that's true of a lot of people's lives. I mean, once yeah. the day begins and you have to do your, your, your regular job or even pay the bills or the telephone starts ringing, it's, it's hard to concentrate. So mm -hmm. those early morning hours are yeah. precious. Yeah. I think it really is, um, again, for me, which is the only thing I know, uh, your, your, your internals or your body or something is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to write in the morning and I like to have a goal, so many words, so many pages, however you set that. And then at some point, one-ish, I'm just, yeah. I'm not good at that. Yeah. That's a pretty long stretch. It is a good long stretch, yeah. Depends when you start. Yeah. <laughs> you know, many writers have talked about the the different sides of writing and they're so di they are so different. Uh, there's the the imaginative side where you have to be in a dream state almost. Right. You have right. to sort of dream your way and not, not edit yourself because you want to get it all out. And then you have to, the editor has to kick in later. The critical side of the brain kicks in. And I think later in the day when you're tired, you know, it's more natural for the critical side to sort of kick in. Which and, is mm -hmm. dangerous. And to be grumpy or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a good time for the critic, you know. But in the early morning, you want to still be a little groggy and dreamy in, in, in a good way. Yeah, and I've heard that, um, that there's a time that you really don't want to self-censor. Right. You just yeah. want to write. Yeah. And, and you, there's time enough to come back and say, well, that was kind of wacky. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, th this is fiction. Tracy, I, I'm not up on your... Mm -hmm vast body of work really. Do you write fiction or no? I started out writing fiction. Okay. Um, my first several books were novels and short stories. Yeah. And then um, around the time of the Oklahoma City bombing in the mid 90s, um, I wound up, I knew, have family in Oklahoma and I wound up talking to people who were on the periphery of the bombing and kind of got sucked into writing some stories about that. Uh, okay. And I didn't want to write fiction. That seemed somehow disrespectful in a way. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, and these people entrusted me with their stories, some of them, and so... Was this an interview then? Well, it wasn't, it didn't begin as or a research. formal... research? Yeah, it didn't yeah. begin that way, formally. Okay. Uh, but then I did wind up spending time with, with uh, some survivors of the bombing and, and others around the city. Um, so it became nonfiction. That was the first time I had tried essay writing. Okay. Um, and and I, I, as I say, I kind of stumbled into that. That sounds then very powerful. many years later, I had a, a, a beloved teacher, a guy named Donald Barthelme, who for many years in the 60s and 70s was a, uh, a very influential short story writer. My goodness, Published yes. in The New Yorker. Yes. And he died in the uh, late 1980s, and I kept waiting for someone to write his biography. I thought he deserved a biography. Of he course. was a very influential writer. <clears throat> Nobody was doing it, so I, again, kind of stumbled forward into writing about him. Um, and then an agent and a, an editor got interested, and uh, so that became my first biography. How did you, or who did you interview, or, or did you? Well, I did. I already knew some of his family okay. because he had been my teacher, sure. and I had spent a lot of time with him and gotten to know some of his family members. And let me just say, for folks who don't know, yeah. this is big time, yeah. Donald Barthelme. Yeah, he he was a mainstay in the New Yorker magazine for sure. for, for two decades. Uh, yeah. Um, and then I, uh, um, then I just started making phone calls and email contact with editors who had worked with him and colleagues, okay. and uh, and it all came together because he was a very beloved figure. People wanted his story out there, so so I published a biography of him, um, which led my editor uh, to suggest writing another biography, and I've now written three more, I think. So okay. I never intended to become a biographer, but it's, <laughs> it's again... A, that was kind uh, of a breakout book, too. It was on yeah. the front page of the New York Times Sunday mm -hmm. book review. Something and and which one? No. Trumpet. Uh, the Barthelme. The Barthelme. Yeah. It was really exciting. Really exciting. But I found that I, I loved writing biography because it, it enabled me to do things that I had not been able to do in fiction. Really? I, I've always wanted to... Uh, to write on a big canvas, I guess, like like Dickens, you know, the whole social scene from the upper crust to the to the lower classes. Okay. I've never been able to figure out how to do that in my fiction. Um, the biography, some of the story is already given to you. You have a lifetime okay. already kind of mapped out for you, and then you can see where the the social and historical and cultural influences came into that life. Sure. And so it, it, it enabled me, I think, to, to broaden the canvas, and uh, it's been very rewarding. Uh, as you speak, it makes perfect sense. 
Had I not heard that, I would have thought it was the opposite, that it was mm -hmm. limiting, mm -hmm. you know, narrow. Yeah. Yeah. They but, read like novels. Well, I would think so. I mean, I would think they could. A good yeah. one, a good mm -hmm. one would do that yeah. and hold your interest. Yeah, because you're, it's you're context. Limited. You're limited by the facts. You can't you can't make things up as you can mm -hmm. in fiction. So you have to you have to hew to the story that you're given in a way. Sure. But when you start looking at where was that person in such and such a year, what was happening in literature that year, right. what was happening historically in right. that year, what wars were being fought, how did that influence the writing? Well, and I would think and personal just, too. You know, yeah, it was yeah, there absolutely. a death, a divorce, a yeah. marriage, something right. that that would influence. Or he or she moved to San Francisco or New York. And San Francisco and New York are very different cultural right. atmospheres, and so right. you can get into the atmospheres of those places, and mm -hmm. it's just a huge canvas. Mm -hmm. um, I told you this was going to go fast, so <laughs> just real quickly, uh, you, you, you were both professors. You have now retired from yes. that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you write full time? I do. I write and then take naps with the cats. That's <laughs> great. great. Now that's something to aspire to. And cleans the basement. Yes. Okay. Right, right. And Marjorie, you're still? I'm still in the saddle. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I think um, June of 2020 is my sort of projected okay. retirement. You know, from I'm teaching. just blanking just out here, but there's a fellow who is a professor and uh, he had such a big book. She's come undone, I think. Um, and he and he's written a couple, of, sort of with Beatle lyrics titles, and then a couple of other things. And they were so big, I thought, oh, he's just going to quit teaching, and uh, and be a writer. But he never did. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, do you um, scheduling wise, do you have a tough time car carving out yeah, time? Definitely, yeah, I definitely do. And I I really I really actually love my students quite a bit, and I don't like to short shrift them. Sure. So I do find it difficult to figure it out. That's why the early mornings are best. <laughs> sure, okay. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, I've, I've heard, um, yeah. well, both men and women, but, but uh, women, you know, traditionally have, have sort of been saddled or have the responsibility of children and uh, then mm -hmm. get up early maybe to, you know, to have some quiet time, right. to some time alone. Yeah. I'm not a morning person, so it's kind of a... <laughs> but it is interesting because literary culture changed over so many years. I mean, in the, in the very old days, say the, the early 20th century, you know, people like Hemingway came up as journalists, and that was the path. To yes. Right. To right. become a novelist was right. the world of journalism. Right. Yeah. And nowadays, it's very much the university of the world of teaching is, is kind of where literature okay. has come to reside, you know, for good or ill. There's, there's, there's pros and cons about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But that's kind of where it is now. And, okay. um, and so that's why I do think whatever bad raps university writing programs sometimes get, um, it's still the place, um, I think, to, to look for community, mm -hmm. you know, for younger writers. I would think so. And you sort of talked about nurturing and, yeah. and, and, and nurturing getting together. And nurturing readers, too. I, yeah. think it, I just think that's, I really, yeah. I really think it's important for young people to read widely uh, and well, literarily. There, I, I guess important. this is a saying, if you're going to write, you have to, to read. read. Mm -hmm. right. We uh, interviewed a woman in my Elizabeth George writing class, very sharp attorney, and she said uh, uh, at some point when we interviewed her, we said, well, what do you like to read? Oh, I don't read. I'm too busy. Uh -uh. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. You can't be too busy no. to read. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's heartening in, in a world of screens, you know, that there are still young people who, who come and, and love, the, love the book. You know, they love that printed word on the page. And I have to tell you, I have uh, grandkids, and they're all big readers, and, uh, they, and they all have tablets. But they don't read on their tablet. They read books. That's and great. I don't know if yeah. it's the smell yeah. of the paper or something, yeah. but yeah. it's just yeah. different. It's well, I'm nostalgic. I love this old typewriter you have here. I'm yeah. nostalgic for that. My grandfather used to have typewriters like that. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, my I, kids I, got me that for my birthday one year. Think how loud you'd be. It's beautiful. How loud? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> well, I'm old enough to have written my first book yeah. on a typewriter, really? not yeah. a word processor. And I remember Fingers spreading the, yeah. <laughs> the paper out, all yeah. the chapters out well, dad, on the floor and reshuffling. My dad bought me an electric mm -hmm. typewriter when I was 16. It was a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very big deal. I've seen pictures of, as an example, um, old Mark Twain, maybe, yeah. and uh, the, the corrections. And I thought, if I had to do that, would I, <laughs> would I write? Yes. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> Yeah. And moving things yeah. around, yeah. of course, right. you know, uh, electronically, it's so easy. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh boy. Guys, this went way too fast. We're out of time, and, and thank you That's so fun. much. Appreciate that was it. Just, thank you. just wonderful to Pleasure. have you. Um, if you're free sometime, maybe we could try again. Yeah. This yeah, was sure. great. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. Very fun. Thanks. Folks, the uh, fast half hour, thank you so much for watching. Um, in fact, let's do this. I'm at stephenwlong.com. Do you want to give your... TracyDarty.com. MarjorieSandor.com. Wow, those are easy. <laughs> really tough. Yeah. So we'll see you next time on The Writing Life. Thanks for watching. Okay, sounds good. Let's go have, let's go lunch. I'm, cool. a, I'm <laughs> hungry. Yeah. Yeah, I can just bite too.